So my topic for today um, is one very near and dear to my own heart, and it's called, I called it, an overview of James. So a while ago, a few people came to me and asked me if I would lead a, a short Bible study through a book of the New Testament, but what they wanted was, it was actually a few students, and where we would usually go through a book verse by verse and very slowly, which is very good, um, they asked me, is it possible that we can do a short book of the Bible and try and cover it very quickly? Because uh, th they had a lot of time, or I think students have a lot of time, and we actually had enough time to do a few, two very long sessions and work through the book of James in two sittings. And uh, when I did that, I just realized it's really special to see the full picture of a shorter book of the Bible. And James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's uh, probably chance, but my second name is Jakobus, which in English is James. And uh, I've just always really enjoyed this book. So my aim this morning is to do a brief overview of James. And I think when Pastor Tiny or Pastor Mark uses the term brief, um, it's with a capital B. But um, I'm going to try and do a brief overview of the book of James. I want to look at its main theme and then also try and make it practical and applicable to us today. Because this book wasn't only written to you know, Jews 1,940 years ago, but it was written to every believer today. So before I start, I want to do an introduction and maybe tell you more about the author, what the book is about and when it was written, who it was written to. And then I have five points that I want to focus on. Basically, I want to look at the five chapters of James and quickly discuss the main theme of each of the chapters. Um, even though, of course, originally the books did, ne did not have chapters when it was written, but it's a, a nice way of breaking it down and seeing the thoughts um, of James when he wrote it. So, four men were called James in the Bible. So, as I was doing prep for this, um, I realized there were actually four James. There was James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. There was James, the son of Alphaeus, who was sometimes called James the, the Less, who was one of the disciples. There was James, the son of Zebedee, brother of John, also one of the disciples. And then finally, there was a James who was the Lord's brother, or Christ, one of his brothers. But I prefer saying one of his half-brothers, I think is a more accurate description. Um, I think there is sufficient evidence that James, the half-brother of Christ, was the author of the epistle of James. The early church believed that he was the author. And in Acts 15, verse 23 to 29, there's a greeting where James greets people. And in that greeting, he uses a Greek word uh, for greeting called Charian, and that word only appears in the New Testament twice, when James is greeting these believers and in James chapter 1, verse 1. So it looks like this was like a unique Greek word that James used. So I think, in short, James, the brother of Christ, is definitely the author of this epistle. It's also probable, very possible, that the book of James was one of the earliest epistles written in the New Testament. And uh, according to Josephus, James was martyred in A.D. 62, so very close to the sacking of Jerusalem. And uh, something interesting about James as an author that I think is astounding, if you, you can, you're welcome to turn here, but if you turn to John chapter 7, verse 5, evidently, before Christ's death, James was not a believer. So in John chapter 7, verse 5, it reads, For not even his brothers were believing in him. And James, being one of those brothers, did not believe in Christ. Obviously, later in his life, at some point, we don't know exactly when, he did come to believe that his brother, or half-brother, was actually the Messiah. He became the key leader of the church in Jerusalem, and was actually described as being one of the pillars of the church. 
Um, we find that in Galatians 2.9. I'm not going to turn there now. As I was preparing for this sermon, I just realized how amazing this turn of events was. This man literally grew up with Jesus. Um, I actually wrote, the man must have known Jesus like a brother, and then no pun intended. He rejects him at first, then accepts him finally to be martyred because of his belief in Christ. At the end of James's life, he could say, like Paul, for me to live was Christ and to die is gain. Now that we've looked at who the author of the book was, I want to discuss the theme and the intended audience. I think it's always very helpful to try and figure out who a book of the Bible was written to originally, because what that helps with, it gives us context on why the book might focus on a specific theme. The book of James was written to saved Jews primarily, originally. We see that in James chapter 1 verse 1. You're welcome to, to turn to James. We are going to be reading from James a lot this morning. So you can turn to James chapter 1 verse 1. So right in the beginning of the book, it starts with, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. So the, the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, AD, this was probably the start of the diaspora where the Jews started leaving Jerusalem and being spread to all corners of the earth. Many of them were spread around the Greek peninsula. When you understand that this book was written to, originally written to a, Jew, a primarily Jewish audience, the main theme of the book makes perfect sense. The main theme of James is faith. James deals with what true faith is. He describes the characteristics of true faith in a very practical way. I think the reason why I like this book so much is because it is incredibly practical. Remember, James was writing to Jews. Before their salvation, they based their faith on good works and rules and regulations. The book of James makes a simple, profound statement, if I can encapsulate the whole book in one statement. True faith will always result in good works. An interesting side note, Martin Luther did not like the book of James. <clears throat> because I think he did not understand the book of James. He came from Catholicism, and uh, he used, before he was saved, he used to believe that your good works will save you. Then he came to Christ and realized that your good works won't save you. You don't do good works to be saved. You could do good works because you are saved. And uh, he, a lot of people misunderstand James because there are sections that look like it's saying that your good works has something to do with your salvation. But I'm uh, going too far ahead. We'll get to that. I'm going to repeat this, though. We do good works not because it will save us. We are saved, and therefore we cannot help but do good works. So the five points that I want to bring across this morning is... Uh, each one of these themes, let's call it the main themes of each of the chapters, in my own words. So chapter 1, it should be on the overhead, I think. Chapter 1 will be a test for true faith. Chapter 2 will be true faith leads to impartiality. Uh, if you want to use a different word, true faith leads to you treating everyone the same. Chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue. Chapter 4, True faith does not quarrel. And lastly, chapter 5, true faith looks ahead. And then I said, in, in parentheses, not at the world around us. So, let's start with chapter 1. A test for true faith, remembering that James was writing this to Jews who were now saved. So, I want us to read James chapter 1, verse 1 to 12. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, the 95 version. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
To the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flowers fall off, and the beauty of his, its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So I want to read verse 12 again. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James starts his epistle with a simple, profound thought. True faith can be tested, and it will remain. I remember reading a quote by David Livingston, where there was a situation where someone approached David Livingston and asked him about a mutual friend of theirs and asked him whether this man was saved or not. And uh, David Livingston jokingly said, or half-jokingly said, you know, I've only known him for two years, I can't tell you. I can see the outside, but God looks at the heart. But then he added and said, if you give me 15 years, I will be able to give you an answer. The point is, the test for true faith, the test for whether someone is saved or not, um, is how they handle trials over the long term. Before I say anything else about this first chapter, I want to define what faith is. I think this is important. The popular idea of faith is basically obstinate optimism. That's how most people would define faith, almost like hope. Most people see faith and hope being like parallel, synonymous terms. A biblical definition of faith, I think, can be found in Hebrews 11 verse 1. So you're welcome to turn there, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. My definition of faith would be, it is not only believing that Christ exists or that God exists. It is believing in what he has done on the cross and that what that means for us in the future. Returning to James chapter 1, James writes to the saved Jewish believers and urges them to test whether their faith is true. Please turn to 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Um, Paul says something very similar. It's actually quite ironic. A lot of people if you ask them whether they're saved or not, they'll probably give you an answer like, uh, you know, seven and a half years ago, I said, that, said a prayer, and that's the reason why I'm saved. Ironically, Paul doesn't quite give the same advice. When people were unsure whether they're saved, this is what he told this congregation. So, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, exclamation mark. So basically, in the Greeks, this would be like nota bene, very important. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Christ 
Jesus is in you unless indeed you fail the test. So I quite like this piece of advice. So when someone <laughs> asks me whether they're saved or not, the way you check is you go and try and see the evidence in your own life. Paul addresses the believers in Corinth and challenges them to test themselves to see whether they are in the faith. The audience that James was writing to were used to living a legalistic, shallow life of rules and regulations. James confronts them with a new truth. If you are truly saved, tests will not shake or change your faith. Full stop. I'm reminded of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It's something we sometimes sing. And uh, one Sunday I was preparing to lead, uh, lead the song and I started reading up on the backstory of the hymn. It Is Well By My Soul was written by Horatio Gates Spafford. And uh, the story for the hymn or the, the inspiration for the hymn was uh, he and his wife and their four daughters were traveling <coughs> from England to America in, I think it was the 1920s or 30s, to go and listen to Spurgeon preach. And uh, they, the ship sank and all four of his daughters died. And uh, of course he grieved that. His wife nearly passed away. And a short while after, he did the journey again and when they reached the exact spot where his daughter's ship and had sank, the, the captain called him and, and told him, do you realize we're, we're sailing over the exact spot where the, the shipwreck is, you know, maybe a kilometer beneath us? And that night he wrote this hymn. And the first verse of the hymn reads, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Chapter 1 summarized, true faith can be tested and it will endure. And uh, I think it's always easier to say this when things are going quite well. It's slightly harder to say this when you're facing a trial. So that's chapter 1. Let's turn to chapter 2. Chapter 2. True faith leads to impartiality. I think this chapter is very applicable to us today. Well, each chapter is, but I want to uh, read James, the second chapter of James, verses 1 to 9. So James chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. I have, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. In the second chapter of James, he continues with the theme of faith, and he applies it to something uniquely practical to us all. 
We live in a godless, man-centered world. People around us base their interactions with others on subjective biases like status, wealth, what education you have, where you come from, what accent you have, what skin color you have. May we as believers not do the same. This section is incredibly practical, and uh, my main point would be, man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And I asked myself a question after reading this chapter, as you should. Do we treat people differently based on where they come from or what their income status is? So if someone comes to church in a Lamborghini, are we going to greet them differently and give them different amounts of attention than if uh, someone has to take a taxi to come to church? I'll leave that rhetorical question with you. Our world is divided. We see racism, sexism, a host of other isms. We as believers must be different. In Galatians 3.28, we see a beautiful illustration of this. Um, it's important for you to remember the Bible has always been politically incorrect and very um, inflammatory. So when, when Paul was writing to the Galatians, he was writing to them in, a, in an era where there were massive differences in, between slaves and free men. Impor remember, in the Roman Empire, according to Pliny the Younger, 45, 30 to 45% of the population consisted of slaves who had been slaves for generations. If you were a slave, you were not treated as completely human. You're like subhuman. So when Paul was writing to the Galatians, he said something that must have shocked his audience. So please turn to Galatians 3, verse 28. And this is linking back to my theme of true faith leads to you treating everyone the same. Paul says, speaking to the believers at, um, well, in Greece, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This was a shocking statement because firstly, the, the Jews who became believers thought themselves better than the infidel Greeks who used to worship many gods. The men thought they were better than women and uh, the non-slaves thought they were better than slaves. And Paul writes to this whole exciting little diverse group and tells them all, you are all exactly the same in front of God. In Christ, we are all the same. A statement that I really like, I can't remember, I think it might have been A.W. Tozer who said this, but a, a theologian that I read at some point said, made this statement, God is no respecter of persons. As I said before, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Um, in the second half of the, first, uh, of the second chapter of James, um, James adds to this thought. So you can turn back to James, James chapter 2. I just want to read verses 14 to 17. So after uh, saying that they are not to be partial, James adds to this and says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Question mark. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. This, these verses can be easily misunderstood. James is not saying that works save us. He is simply saying that if you are saved, you will do good works. If someone tells me, they are a Christian, and I've known this person for 20 years, and absolutely nothing has changed. They are not saved. Uh, so an illustration that I quite like, uh, that's really funny, is uh, Paul Washer once told a story, and he said, 
if you walk across the highway and you have a uh, exciting meeting point with a 50 ton truck that hits you at 120 kilometers per hour, you will not remain unscathed. And then he said right after that, if you have a close personal meeting with the almighty holy God, you will not remain unscathed. The point is, if you tell me that you really have a, you know, that God lives inside you, your life will look different. Uh, verse 26, I want to finish with verse 26 for this point. Verse 26 illustrates what James is saying. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Our, our uh, works do not save us, but if we are truly saved, and if we are truly saved, we will have good works, and the good works will be evident to all. If you say you are truly saved, and absolutely nothing has changed in your life, then you're not saved. Summary of chapter 2. True faith leads to us treating everyone the same. If we are truly saved, we will do good works. And I need to add something here because it's easy to fall into the trap of legalism. Did you notice that James did not give them a checklist of good works that you're supposed to do? He didn't say you have to do A, B, C, D, E, and G to, be, to prove that you're saved. He's simply saying, if you're truly saved, your good works will be evident to all. Um, and I, I like the fact that he doesn't give specifics because unfortunately, as humans, we love rituals and we love trying to save ourselves. Uh, my, my youngest sister once asked me, what makes Christianity unique? Why do we believe that what we believe is true compared to every other religion that exists? And I actually had to, thought, to think about that and then I realized because Christianity is the only religion that teaches you are utterly unable to save yourselves and you can do nothing to make you right in front of God. Every other religion teaches do these things and maybe you have a chance. Christianity teaches you have no chance except what Christ has done. So let's uh, turn to chapter 3. So chapter 2 summarized, true faith leads to you treating everyone the same. Chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like James wrote this book just to trigger me um, in each chapter. But in chapter 3, James continues his thought from the previous chapter. True faith leads to practical results. In this case, controlling our tongue. So I want us to read James, starting, James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. So James continues, and once again I want to note he is speaking to believers. He's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to people who were in the church. Let not many of you become teachers, my <coughs> brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity or sin. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and of birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men 
who has been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Question mark. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. James uses terms like the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, set on fire by hell, and it is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Evidently, the tongue is very dangerous. And as verse 8 tells us, it is humanly impossible to control the tongue. I always used to think, you know, when you look at uh, maybe some of the best marathon runners in the world, they train 365 days a year. They usually run about 300 kilometers a week, which works out about 50 kilometers a day. And they do two or three training sessions each day, and they don't really take rest days. I used to think that is an example of someone who is very disciplined, because most of us won't be able to do that. Unfortunately, James tells us there's a different answer. If you want to see someone who is very disciplined, it is someone who can control their tongue. That is the true test. He's almost being sarcastic and saying, if you can control your tongue, you have absolutely control over every part of your body. The next heart, well, this, this, uh, sta these statements all sound very negative and very dangerous, and it's, it's almost depressing because it says that it's humanly impossible to control your tongue. But he also gives the solution to this problem. So I want you to read verses 13 to 17. So after speaking about how dangerous the tongue is, James gives us some hope. He says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him or her show by their good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above, and focus on these descriptions, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Basically, humanly speaking, it is impossible to control your tongue. Only God, by His power, can help you control your tongue. I feel like I don't need to add much, much to this section or to this point. Um, I think James makes it very clear. But uh, this section should truly challenge your heart as a challenged mind. Um, Paul reiterates this truth about the danger of the tongue in two sections. I'm going to read it. You're welcome to turn there. Otherwise, you can just listen to me. So in 1 Peter 3, verse 10, Paul says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. And in uh, Ephesians, sorry, that was Peter. And Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who would listen. Think of how high the standard is. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. So, to summarize chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue. As believers, we must be very careful what we say. We can easily destroy our witness. Think about this. What does it help that you, you know, preach the gospel to someone or uh, 
speak uh, in a very gentle, nice way to an unbeliever, and then the next day you're having a really difficult day, and then you, you know, either start gossiping about someone or you start swearing. That's an absolute double standard. Why would anyone believe that you are truly different from the world? We, um, it is not only what we say, but it is also how we say it. That is why we need to pray for wisdom from above and how to handle situations. So, chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue. Let's turn to chapter 4. True faith does not quarrel. In chapter 4, James mentions another practical result of true faith. I want to read a few verses from James 4. He says, again, speaking to the believers, what is the source? Uh, also, I need to add uh, on a humorous note, I think someone should maybe send this uh, section to the United Nations as well because it, it uh, gives the solution to why the UN is not the solution. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is, it not the, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The source of fighting and quarreling in the church and in the world is our fallen sinful natures. Friendship with the world is enmity to God. It is always good to remember that the gospel is exclusive. Christ did not come and tell people that uh, you're very welcome to accept me and continue enjoying everything else that you know is wrong. The gospel is exclusive. God is a jealous God who does not permit or allow competition. Matthew 12, 30 reiterates this. You can turn there if you like. Matthew 12, 30. So this is Jesus speaking. And this section actually talks about the unpardonable, unpardonable sin, but I want to read verse 30. Christ talking, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. The point is basically, the world or the fallen world system around us, I just need to make this point, sometimes as believers we talk about the world, and it's, it's possible for people to misunderstand that. We're not talking about the sunshine and the trees and the nice mountains and the animals. We're talking about the fallen world system. So whether that's Satan or people's sin natures, we're not talking about nature. The world, or rather the fallen world system, is at enmity with God. Um, the only solution is submission to God. So I want to continue. So let's go back to James chapter 2. So after speaking about the source of the quarrels, he gives the solution. So James chapter 2, verse 7. Then he says, uh, sorry, James chapter 3, verse 7. So after speaking about the uh, James 4, guys, I, my, I don't know where my mind is. Okay, so after speaking about the what the source of quarreling and fighting is, which is our sin nature, what I love about James is he, I almost want to say without sarcasm, he puts the fear of God into people, and then after all these terrible statements, he gives the solution as well. So in James 4, starting in verse 7, after saying, you know, what is the source of quarrels, he says, this is the solution. Submit therefore to God, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. The only solution to quarreling and infighting 
is submitting yourself to God. Uh, the last part of the chapter deals with the danger of planning without God, but I want to focus more on this, this one point. True faith does not quarrel, it builds up. And uh, an interesting test for me regarding theology, for example, I, I enjoy theology and I enjoy uh, having discourses with people who disagree with me on whatever it might be. But I realized very quickly, a lot of the times it is more important to lose the arguments and win the person than to push the point just to prove that you're, I don't know, theologically correct and lose the person. A Christ-like attitude is someone who builds people up and who does not break them down. So if your incredibly strong opinion on, I don't know, revelation is going to cause division, don't. So lastly, I want to look at chapter 5. So, so far, we've looked at uh, chapter 1, a test for true faith. We've looked at chapter 2, true faith leads to impartiality. We've looked at chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue. We've looked at chapter 4, true faith does not quarrel. And lastly, chapter 5, true faith looks ahead. And then I said in parentheses, not at the world around us. James starts the last chapter of his epistle with another exhortation. So please turn to James chapter 5. I just want to read the first six verses. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. So remember, in the day that James lived, the division, there was no such thing as a middle class. The division between having something and having nothing was massive. So you either had people who had many slaves and probably owned a business, and you had people who were slaves. So when he's bashing the rich, he's bashing people who uh, basically worshipped their material goods and not God, and uh, also who placed their assurance on material goods. So I asked my dad once, why is it that even in, in Matthew, you know, Matthew 6, 24, we can turn there, but why is it that it seems like Christ is very hard on the rich of his day or the nobles? And uh, the reason is, I think, when you have nothing, it is relatively easy to trust on God for something. When you have everything, it is simpler to fall into the trap of believing you don't necessarily <coughs> need Him. And uh, I think when you have vast amount of wealth, it is easy to fall into the trap of trusting in your bank balance, because money can do a lot. Um, but he starts with this exhortation about not focusing on the world around us. And uh, I also want you to quickly turn to 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, because I think this is important. I want to make this statement before it's pulled out of context. I've heard so many, misquote, so many people misquote this verse. So my grandfather, my great-grandfather, came to South Africa from the Netherlands with nothing and uh, worked very hard for a very long time to just get enough money to actually have food. So I have a theory, the one reason why my grandmother nearly falls into the dwarf category is uh, because they, they literally did not have food growing up. 
her brothers had to go into the fields in the Netherlands in winter and try and get frozen potatoes so that they would not starve to death in the great hunger of, I think, 1944, where a lot of Dutch people starved to death. Um, and uh, this great-grandfather of mine used to have a statement. Uh, I, I think I might misquote it, but he basically said, it is no shame to be very poor, but it is unfortunate. <laughs> so, um, so in any case, uh, this, this verse is, is, is misquoted a lot, and uh, it's important to understand this distinction. The world that we live in runs on money. Money is the way that we are able to do things. Money is the way that we are able to help other believers. If you have nothing, you have nothing to give. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money, for the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It does not say money is the root of all evil. Money is very practical, and you can do a lot with it. If you are obsessed with and lusting after money, that is a big problem. But there's a big distinction. Um, Jesus said something similar in Matthew 6, 24. I'm not going to read that passage, but he basically says, you cannot serve two masters. Um, you need to choose between the things of this world and God. A sad example of someone who decided to choose the world rather than follow God is uh, found in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10, where one of Paul's fellow evangelists, a man called Demas, who had already been on, I think, one missionary journey with Paul, just vanish, vanishes from the rest of Scripture. We never hear anything of him again, and all that the Bible says is, are these words, he fell in love with this present world, and we never hear anything of him again. And that, that is a very sad last statement to read about someone. May this not be true of us. May we be able to say at the end of our lives, like Paul, for me to have lived was Christ and to die is gain. After giving this very stark warning about not falling in love with material things, James ends the chapter and the epistle by focusing on what lies ahead. So for, he starts by, again, putting the fear of God into them about just accruing material things and putting their trust in that. And then he, he focuses their attention to what, is, but what lies ahead. Please turn to James chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. So then he says, therefore, after warning them about not just focusing on material things, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and ra late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. In short, Christ's return, return is imminent. This reality should have an impact on our lives. I'm just going to um, give one example that I was thinking of. If, you, if there is a sport that you do, whether it's running or cycling or swimming, and uh, you are going through a, a phase where you're training really hard, um, I know uh, Stefan Streidholm swims a lot, so I sympathize with that. But if you're training for like three hours a day, at some point you wake up and you ask yourself how much you really enjoy doing what it is that you're doing. And what usually gives you the drive is having a due date for a race coming up. So when I'm training for a marathon and I'm trying to run like 120 kilometers a week or something, and I ask myself why I'm doing this, and I remember, okay, I've actually entered this race, the due date is coming up, and I'm training for something. James is saying the same thing here. When things are going, are more difficult, remember what is coming. Remember the goal that lies ahead of you. Paul also reiterates this thought in 1 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read this. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Uh, in Paul's day, there was no participation medals. Um, run in such a way that you may win. 
everyone who competes in the games, these are the Olympic games, exercises self-control in all things. So they do it, so they do it to obtain a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. True faith looks ahead and ignores the fallen world around us. We are in the world, but not of the world. This does not mean, and once again, you can rip this out of context and become over-spiritualize it. This does not mean that we go and live in a monastery somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains. It simply means that even though we are in the world, we keep our minds focused on the things to come and the things above. Um, and then I, I actually mentioned, uh, speak more on this topic if there is time, but there isn't. So let's, let's move on. Um, I want to get to application. So we've looked at five points from the five chapters of James. James focuses on faith. And uh, we've seen that in chapter 1, there's a test for true faith. Then true faith leads to impartiality. True faith controls the tongue. True faith does not quarrel. True faith looks ahead. So here are some practical questions that I want you to ask yourself. And uh, my dad reminded me, when you're preaching, you're actually preaching to yourself. So for a few weeks now, I've been thinking about these questions. Um, and these are relevant to everyone. So firstly, are you truly saved? I think that's a very uh, obvious question to start with. But I enjoy the fact that the New Testament challenges us to make sure if you grow up in a family where your parents are saved, or maybe a sibling is saved, it's very easy to fall into the trap of just being comfortable because everyone around you say the right things, do the right things. Um, so, are you truly saved? Do you have Christ as your Savior? Do you understand the fact that you need Him? If you believe that you're a good person, then you don't need God. If you are not saved... Now is the time, and don't, don't waste time. So, you know, there are several elders and several deacons. Speak to someone afterwards. Don't waste time. Secondly, how do you or I treat others? Do we really treat them with a Christ-like attitude? Or do we treat some people differently to other people? Do you or I have control of our tongues? Do we use it to honor God or do we use it to break people down around us? Do you allow your sinful nature to reign over you? Do you love fighting and quarreling with other people? Or do you put sin to death in your heart? Are you earnestly looking for Christ's return? Um, I remember reading about this missionary in China who was saying that the Chinese believers are really very serious about praying for Christ's return because a lot of them are in prison, a lot of them are being tortured, a lot of them are being executed. So the two alternatives that most of them see is either they will, be, either they will die in prison be executed or Christ will return. And I can actually see which one of those three is the, the nicer alternative. So when things are going really well for you, it's tempting to not be very serious about hoping and looking forward to Christ's return. When things are going really badly, then it's your, your only hope. Um, so I think it's ironic. I think a lot of Christians in difficult parts of the world are, ver are much more serious about praying that Christ should return quickly than we are. Um, then, in conclusion, true faith will always result in good works. Our good works do not save us, but if we are saved, we cannot help but do good works. True faith can be tested. True faith looks at others in an impartial, loving way. True faith controls the tongue. True faith does not quarrel. True faith looks ahead. 
I want to finish with this section from Colossians. Uh, you, you can turn there. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. This is my closing statement. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, or if you are saved, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you very much that we have this opportunity to, to look at James and to do a, an overview of James. And I thank you for these eternal truths that you have given us. And I just pray that you challenge our hearts, our hearts right now that this will not be some dry theology or some dry theory, but that it will be very, very practical um, in the way that we live every day. We get so many opportunities to speak to people and we get so many opportunities to just live our lives differently to the people around us. And we know that we are lights in a dark world and there are many hopeless people who are desperately in need of your truth. So give us opportunities to share the gospel. Give us opportunities to be ready to, to um, explain to people the hope that lies within us. And I pray that you bless the rest of our week and uh, help us to glorify you in, in everything that we do, whether it's working or studying or going to school or doing sports, that all will be to your glory and honor. Amen.